the Blue Jackets are getting closer and closer to hiring their next head coach. Who are the options? Who's the most likely? Who do we like the best? We're going to talk about that on today's Locked on Blue Jackets. Your Locked on Blue Jackets, your daily podcast on the Columbus Blue Jackets, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Blue Jackets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am, as always, your host, Jay Foster, here to give you the good, the bad, and the ugly about your favorite team and mine, Columbus Blue Jackets. Before we get started, I want to thank everyone for making this your first listen of the day every single day. Locked On Blue Jackets continues to be free and available on all podcast platforms and over on YouTube. I'll have to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus every single day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Let's talk coaches, um, because that's kind of what I want to talk about right now, um, because I can almost guarantee that as soon as I finish recording this episode, they will announce the new head coach, but uh, we'll try to get out in front of that. Um, Confirmed three finalists. Two of the finalists have been, I think, unofficially named, and then the third finalist no one has been able to figure out yet, but they're pretty sure it's between one of two guys. So we're going to talk about all four guys today, um, who I like the most, who I think is the most likely to get the job. Um, and uh, then I've got a couple of, of really great mailbag questions when I asked earlier um, or when I asked last weekend. So we're going to talk about those as well. Um, let's start off with, I think, my personal favorite option um, for, for coaching. Um, it, it's not necessarily the most likely, um, but I think he's definitely in the top half of the four options. He's like top two of the four options, you know, which not a lot, but I think, um, I think this is the guy that, that it's, it's his job to lose. I think, you know, maybe someone else comes along and has a really great interview. Maybe someone wants less money than him. Uh, all of these kind of options. We'll talk about the, the money in, in a little bit as well, because Aaron Portside tweeted something interesting, uh, earlier today that I wanted to kind of touch on a little bit as well. So we're going to start off by talking about Todd McClellan. Um, this is the one that makes the most sense to me. Um, I, I think he has done a, he did a pretty good job in LA uh, developing young players. Um, he turned, he kind of job started Adrian Kempe from fine player into really quite good player. Um, he did a great job with the youth there. Um, he struggled in the playoffs, uh, got out coached in the playoffs by um, just kind of not really adapting very well but i don't see todd mcclellan as like the coach of the future you know he's not going to be here for the next 10 years my guess is he's here for two to three years maximum gets the team back on track picks them out of the basement um you know i heard someone on twitter call it uh that he's going to take bad teams to mid and then you find someone else to take mid to good um and i, I think the blue jackets will probably be better than mid under McClellan, but I don't know that they're going to be cup contenders under um, under McClellan. So he's he's got a, a decent amount of um, coaching experience. Uh, he was with the Sharks from 2008 to 2015. He was with the Oilers from 2015 to 2018. Uh, and then uh, was with the uh, Kings from 2019 to 2024, which I didn't realize he was there for that long. But uh, he's been coaching for... He's been coaching for a hot minute, you know, and he's not that old, which is great, you know. Not that age is like a prerequisite to coaching, but there comes a point at which I feel like you are too old to really be able to coach effectively, um, relate to the players. Um, and also, frankly, if you're like 70 years old, why don't you want to just retire? Like, just go sit on the couch. It's fine. Um, but Lock Island is my favorite of the options. Um, and I've kind of talked about him in in detail on on previous episodes of this but like i just he seems to me like a good coach for for a a young team um i think that like i said i think he did good things with the youth in uh la uh they uh went to to their two playoff appearances in in the five years that he was there um and it took him a minute to get going, but, uh, you know, as of, as of right now, he's got a record of, uh, 
He's played, he's coached 100, uh, 1,144 games and he's got 598 wins, which is a near enough 500. So he's not like the most outstanding coach necessarily. I'm not looking at him as like the savior of the franchise or whatever, but I think they needed, and they talked about needing a coach with experience. Um, they need someone to come in, implement systems, stick to it. And um, I think there's been some whispers that, you know, there was trouble with um, a full team buy-in with first-time coaches like Larson and Vincent. So having someone like Todd McClellan come in, I think whether that's, you know, deserved or not, he'll get more respect from the players than, you know, a first-time coach would. Um, so all, all four of these options are experienced head coaches, um, some of them more experienced than others. Um, and I think Tom McClellan is, is like my my preferred pick. Um, I wouldn't be mad if they if they went with one of the other options or like one of specifically one of the other options um, uh, who we're going to talk about in a minute. But Tom McClellan is, I think, right now, if they had to go with one of these four, he's at the top of my list. Um, let's talk about the guy in second place. Um, I didn't mean to come into this ranking them, but uh, it just kind of just happened. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about Jay Woodcroft, who is the least experienced of uh, of all of these coaching options. Um, uh, funnily enough, he was a uh, an assistant coach under Todd McClellan in uh, San Jose. Uh, he was also with the Red Wings when McClellan was uh, in 2005. He was hired as a video coach. When McClellan left Detroit as an assistant to be a head coach in San Jose, Woodcroft went with him as assistant coach. Um, and then uh, he also worked under him with the Oilers as well uh, as an assistant coach with uh, McClellan as the head coach. Um, Woodcroft was named the uh, head coach of the Bakersfield Condors. They had a pretty good run under him uh, they won the regular the Pacific Division regular season title in 2019 and then they won the playoff championship in the 2020 2021 season which was that weird like um not really a chat not really a playoffs playoffs um the Pacific Division basically had their own little thing that they did because of uh, travel restrictions etc um he was made interim coach of the Oilers in uh February 2022 and then they kept him on as a uh, as the head coach um, until uh, this most recent season, uh, November twenty twenty three. The team started three nine and one. He got fired. The team turned it around. Whether that's just because it was a slow start and they turned it around themselves, um, but I feel again this is the this is the coach that has the the least experience, but. In that small, um, in that kind of small window, he did he did pretty darn good. Again, with the Oilers, that's you can argue about whether you need a good coach for the Oilers, who have you know two of the top five players in the world right now. Um, but in his first kind of interim season, he went twenty six nine and three. In his second season, he went fifty twenty three and nine. Uh, second in the Pacific both times. Uh, when eight, it went to the conference finals. Uh, in 2021-22, against uh, lost against Colorado, and then they lost in the second round to Vegas in 22-23, and Vegas went on to win the cup. So you know, uh, some pretty good, some pretty good results here. Like I said, slow start with Edmonton um, in 23-24, but I don't know how much of that is is Woodcroft, and how much of that is uh, just that the Oilers kind of had a a slow start. You know, like I said. They they turned it around, made it all the way to the uh, Stanley Cup final. Um, so we'll uh, we'll see this season. I think whether um, the replacement uh, with who uh, uh, Chris Knobloch, who was the uh, head coach of the Hartford Wolfpack in the AHL, um, whether he can keep the the Oilers kind of on that trajectory of being a, a good team, or if it was just kind of one of those things that happened. Um, I like McClellan better than Woodcroft just because I think he has that little bit more experience. Um, and I don't generally, I'm not a fan of uninspired retreads as someone called McClellan, but he feels like a good right now coach for the Blue Jackets, kind of in the same way that John Tortorella was a great coach for the Blue Jackets at that point in time. You know, 
drag them back to uh, or into, I guess, um, respectability. He put some, he put their name, uh, he put some respect on their name around the league. Um, and I think McClellan will not necessarily do the same thing, but I think he'll be good for the Blue Jackets kind of in the phase of their game that they are right now. Woodcroft feels like a longer term bet. I think the team will be better this year under McClellan, but I think they might have more long term success under Woodcroft. So I guess that's kind of that's kind of what what we need to think about here is are they hiring a coach, a long term coach, or are they hiring a short term coach to try and get them back into kind of the playoff picture and then find someone to help them take them to that next level? So. I could really go either way. I think I, I still lean towards McClellan, but I wouldn't be mad if they uh, if they went ahead and hired Woodcroft. Something of note as well is uh, Woodcroft will likely command less salary than McClellan, and the Blue Jackets uh, are still going to be paying... Um, I believe they're still going to be paying both Mike Babcock and Pascal Vincent in uh, in this in this season. So is spending money on coaching? We'll see. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to talk about the other two guys. Um, so those are the two guys that have kind of been unofficially confirmed as, um, as finalists. And then we're going to talk about two more guys who no one's been able to figure out which one is the finalist of the two, but these are kind of my, I would rather they wouldn't options. Um, so we're going to talk about those guys in just a second here on Locked on Blue Jackets. First, I'm going to tell you about FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much, I never want them to stop. But playoffs have wound down, there's no games going on, and the sports aren't sporting like I want them to. However, it's not all bad news. FanDuel is going to let me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I've got to do is open up the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster or a bonus every single day. Something for everyone, every day, all summer long. Head over, over to FanDuel, start making the most out of your summer. You can bet on the baseball, uh, the NFL. It's going to be back real soon, I believe. Uh, so FanDuel.com is where it's at. FanDuel is the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball and also us, the Locked On Podcast Network. Welcome back to Locked On Blue Jackets. We're talking head coach... Uh, options um and we've kind of gone through my my top two of the potential four um let's talk about the other two guys which i am less enthusiastic about uh one of those guys is dean everson who was i believe most recently head coach for the uh minnesota wild um coached them for i believe four seasons um he was named interim head coach in february 2020 uh, was as an assistant coach for a couple of seasons before that. Uh, July 2020, uh, they named him head coach. And then, he, so he spent parts of five seasons with the team, both as interim. Uh, and then they fired him on November 2023. Uh, kind of similar with the Oilers. Um, they went 5, 10, and 4 to start the season, the Wild, uh, and had a seven-game losing streak. That was it for Everson. Um, has got some NHL ga- experience as a player, which is something that uh, Woodcroft uh does not um and in terms of his head coaching record uh the wild made the playoffs all four times that um the that everson was in charge they uh technically anyway they finished six in the central in that weird covid year and uh they lost in the qualifying round to vancouver so technically they made the playoffs but also did they make the playoffs um, they were not one of the 16 teams that played in the playoffs, but they did technically make the postseason, I guess. Um, they finished third in the West uh, the next season, which that was the weird, again, the, like the second weird COVID season where all of the teams got messed up. Um, lost in the first round to Vegas, uh, was second in the Central, and then third in the Central in 22 and 23. Lost in the first round. Uh, so four straight first round exits for the Wild, but hey, they did make the playoffs during that time in 251 nhl games of coaching experience he's won 147 of those games so that's about 66 percent ish i want to say 60 to 65 percent which again not a bad winning percentage and again feels maybe a little bit like a mcclellan hire um who will not boost the blue jacket into cup contention but will probably drag them out of 
the basement. Um, I am not as enthusiastic about this hire as I am about McClellan. Um, I think just because, the, again, this is mostly based on what I've heard from Wild fans and uh, my friend Seth Topal, who uh, hosts Locked on Wild, was not super enthusiastic about Everson. Um, but all of the Kings fans that I talked to about McClellan were more complimentary of him. Despite the fact that he maybe has a worse record on the surface, he's probably a better coach. So, you know, take take from that what you will. That's just kind of what I've heard. Um, it, it's not the end of the world if they hire Everson, but I will be kind of disappointed by this hire, it feels a little bit like, yeah, you know, it's, it, it's, it sure is an NHL head coach, you know, he's got experience, um, he's not a million years old, he's had success in the league, um, I just, I'm not enthusiastic about the hire, it's a very average hire, you know, solid B minus C plus hire, I guess, not an F, so there's that at least, um, and he might even not be, uh, he might not even be a finalist, you know, again, no one has really been able to find out who the finalists were, uh, but it's going to be either, they figure it, they figured it was Todd McClellan, Jay Woodcroft, and one of Dean Everson, who we've just talked about, and Gerard Gallant, who we're going to talk about in just a second here. Gerard Gallant is, is kind of at the bottom of my list, not for any kind of real reason, just uh, not like, because I think he's a bad coach. He's just like the lowest of these options, I think um, he has, or he's previously uh, coached the Blue Jackets. Um, he was not the first head coach, but he coached them for three seasons, um, missed the playoffs the first two seasons, and then got fired, what, 21, 22 games into the season, 15 games into the season uh, after going five, nine, and one. Then was with Florida for three years, got fired unceremoniously. Uh, was with Vegas for three years and then got fired unceremoniously. Just very strange um, firings both times. Um, and then again, in New York, he was, uh, or I believe his, he wasn't fired. I don't think his contract was renewed or they relieved him during the off season because he played, he coached two full seasons for uh, the Rangers. Um, first, they finished second in the Metro, lost in the conference finals to Tampa Bay, who I believe went on to win the cup that year. And then uh, in 22-23, they finished third in the Metro, lost in the first round to the Devils. Um, had uh, 99 out of 164 wins in his time with uh, the Golden Knights, uh, with the Rangers, excuse me, in 705 head coaching record games. He's won 369 of those. So again, an above... Um, an above 500 coaching record. There's just, I don't know, I don't understand what is up with his career trajectory because to, so R Rangers lost in the first round to the, to the Devils. Okay, fine, whatever. But 47 wins that season, 52 wins the season before that. Vegas fired him uh, when they had a record of 24, 19, and 6 uh, out of 49 games, which, again, that's just over 500 fired uh, after two straight playoff appearances. Uh, went 11, 10, and 1, fired in Florida after making the playoffs, winning the Atlantic Division, 47 wins in 82 games. I don't, I don't know, just the weirdest the weirdest coaching trajectory, like after being, after uh, being fired by the Blue Jackets uh, in 2007, he didn't head coach again until 2014. Um, and then took a year out between Vegas and the Rangers. And then uh, didn't work this season, I believe was on, um, was on some kind of, I believe he was on some TV network. I don't remember off the top of my head or if he just had a year out but just a really weird coaching career and that's kind of what gives me a little bit of pause is the team wasn't losing on the ice maybe they were underperforming expectations in Vegas's case but just very strange to fire a coach when the team is 500 or better in the middle of the season or again when your team has almost 100 wins over two seasons um, and then just deciding not to, 
not to bring the play, not to bring the coach back. So it makes me wonder if something is going on behind the scenes, or I don't know. But it does kind of give me pause as to why, uh, by all accounts, a good coach can't keep a job. Um, again, wouldn't be I, I, I'd be I wouldn't be dis I wouldn't be mad if they hired Gallant. I would be confused and maybe a little bit disappointed. Again, he's not one of my favorites for the for the job. Uh, but we'll see. He might not even be a finalist. Again, I can almost guarantee that as soon as I hit stop recording on this, they will announce the new head coach, and this will become um, out of date immediately. But it is what it is. We move on. Uh, and we're actually going to move on um, because I want to answer a couple of mailbag questions I got. Uh, one of them is uh, is really interesting. Uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna do that in just a second here on Locks on Blue Jackets. Welcome back to Locked on Blue Jackets. Uh, we've gone through all of the coaching options, my favorites, who I think is the most likely, uh, and some guys that I am less enthusiastic and feel are less um, viable options. Um, I do just want to finish off before we get into the. Uh, if we get into the mailbag, um, Aaron Portsline had an interesting tweet thread earlier today uh, that I wanted to just kind of touch on very briefly. Um, here it is. So something to consider. Uh, the belief candidates, he said, Todd, Todd McClellan, Dean Everson, Jay Woodcroft, uh, all have contracts with their former clubs that run through next season. So potentially there are two negotiations. Unless the Blue Jackets want to pay full freight next season, which would be five and a half million for Todd McClellan, and then or two million eat roughly for Evanson or Everson or Woodcroft, Don Waddell must negotiate a salary that's acceptable to their former club, which pays the remaining balance of their contract, and they must approve that before the coach is allowed to take the new job. Once the Blue Jackets and their former club have agreed on the 24 and 25 portion of the contract, the next negotiation is directly between the Blue Jackets and the coach for the remaining years on the contract. Waddell is known to get salary requests from candidates before the final interviews, so this stage should move quickly, but something to keep in mind, um, and I mentioned that McClellan is probably going to command the most money of these options, um, especially if it's Everson and Woodcroft, the other two finalists. Um, so whether that comes into account again, um, and I know something that Hurricanes fans were frustrated with was that Don Waddell didn't really seem to spend money when he when you know there was ostensibly money to be spent part of that was was the owner part of that was probably just kind of bias from the fan base but i'll be interested to see what happens here in terms of how much money mcclellan everson or woodcroft end up getting um and again you have to keep in mind that the blue jackets are definitely paying pascal vincent for this season because i believe they signed him to a two-year contract and i don't know the specifics on babcock they originally signed him to a two-year contract which does make me think that they're probably paying him unless they paid him like a severance package or whatever, or some kind of came to an agreement with, you know, termination of the contract. They could potentially be paying three head coaches this season. So that's again, something to keep in, keep in mind, especially when you're looking at Todd McClellan, who is probably going to command the most money of those three guys. Now let's, let's move on from coaching uh, because I'm running a little bit long here and I do want to, uh, look at the two questions that I got. Um, so we'll start off with uh, this one, uh, who is at EP Light the Lamp on Twitter. Besides the Line A deal, what other trade could you see go down before the season starts? Um, that's a really great question. Uh, I don't know that there are any kind of other glaring options for uh, for trades. Um, just kind of again a quick quick look at the the roster um like i still think that there's a chance that ivan provorov gets moved um at the uh at, at some point in the summer i think it's more likely he gets flipped at the deadline but i could see him being moved um i don't think moslikins is going to be moved he's kind of the other guy that everyone loves to put in in trade scenarios but Waddell has kind of come out and said listen if we can get elvis back up to where he needs to be great and that's going to be our first option instead of probably losing a trade by having to shift prospects or picks or you know draft capital or whatever with that most leakage contract um someone else that people love to put in trade scenarios is kent johnson and again i don't think i don't see that happening either i really don't um i don't know why you would 
a, a, a former fifth overall pick that struggled and was injured last season. I like he's just coming off his ELC. I don't know why you would sell low on a guy like Ken Johnson. Um, if you want him to, you know, he's he should be one of the he should be part of the top six for the next ten years. You know, um, so I guess the answer to the answer to your question is kind of. I don't really see an option for any other trades, but there are some possibilities out there. You know, I think the most likely is probably Provorov. I think the least likely is um, Muslikins. Uh, <clears throat> with the kind of signing of Monaghan, I think there's less rush to make a trade in the uh, in the organization. You know, they were looking for that top six center or potential middle six center, I think, which I think is where Monaghan is likely going to slot in. Um, and they found that in, in free agency, so they didn't have to give up any assets for it. So there's already kind of a log jam. That's the other thing is when any trades that you make, I don't think you're going to get a roster player back for. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of the, the tough bit. You know, I do wonder what it means for the line, a trade, whether you get a roster player back or whether you get futures. Um, we'll see. Everything is still kind of up in the air since he's, Still in the, the NHLPA program, and uh, they keep telling us any day now, but they've been saying any day now for like three weeks. So we'll see what happens there. I don't think there will be another trade before the season starts for the Blue Jackets, besides a potential line A deal. So could be wrong. We'll see. Uh, another question uh, from uh, at Mr. Ed315 on Twitter. In my estimation, what's left for Blue Jackets management to accomplish this offseason? To this point, what letter grade would you assign for its efforts in rebuilding the roster? Um, other things that, that need accomplishing, obviously, uh, head coach, I think, is next on the list. And then I would look for uh, the, the RFA contract. That's got to be the next priority as opposed, you know, instead of adding to the roster, you need to regather the the roster the roster um assets that you have so marchenko uh greaves and christensen i think are probably the priorities there um for arbitration purposes they can get to a contract without going to arbitration arbitration that's great cole sillinger probably next because he's at risk of offer sheets and then uh, unfortunately kent johnson is uh, a 10.2 c uh, rfa which means they haven't accrued the number of professional seasons required for group two RFA status, which means they can't go to arbitration and they are also ineligible for an offer sheet. So he is still an important task that needs to be done, but that I think is the lowest priority. To me, the biggest priority right now is Marchenko. Um, and then once you've finished the RFA talk, signed all those guys, then I think Patrick Line trade is the next step. Um and after that, I think they're pretty they're pretty good, you know. Um, I think it's what July 9th. So they've got about two months before training camp starts to two and a half months. No, probably closer to closer to two and a half months. They've got the rookie tournament, um, which is like mid-September sometime normally. Um, so we'll uh we will see what happens. Um, but there's nothing out there that I'm like, they absolutely need to have this done immediately. Get the coaching sorted, get the RFA sorted, line A trade, and then enjoy the rest of your summer. Come back mid-September, rookie camp, training camp, preseason, let's go. Um, in terms of letter grades, uh, I would give this a, I think I would give this a solid B. You know, um, they haven't done a ton. Um, they've cut some some quote-unquote fat, obviously getting rid of Adam Boquist, getting rid of Jake Bean, um, who aren't returning, uh, adding Sean Monaghan, adding Jack Johnson. Um, but for the most part, they're just kind of... And this is kind of... This is what Don Waddell has been saying, I think, pretty much since he got the job, is that he has he doesn't have to do a ton to this roster. Just tweak it. And I think he's, I think he's done that. You know, he hasn't overreacted. He hasn't gone out there. And, you know, a lot of people over the summer were like, man... New GM's going to come in, trade everyone, burn it to the ground. Boone Jenner's going to get sent to Toronto. Ken Johnson's going to get traded for beans. Like, everyone's going to get traded, and they're going to start from scratch. And he hasn't done that, you know, because there's there's good bones here for this team. And so I'm going to give him a solid B, B-plus 
for what they've accomplished so far this offseason. Like, the Jack Johnson contract is what it is. It's fine. Like, it's not the end of the world. Even if he's terrible, it is it is what it is. The Monaghan contract, you know, I've talked about it. I've come around a lot on that signing. I still think it's a million too much uh, and a year too long, but that's what happens in free agency. Um, the draft I liked. I thought they got a lot of really good pieces. Really excited about Caden Lindstrom. Um, I would probably have, have kept one of Boquist or Bean, but... They both went, so opens up options for Juracek, for Matejchuk, potentially for Jake Christensen. Um, I've liked the contract that he's handed out so far. So, I mean, again, nothing that's going to break the bank, but I like the Chinikov extension. Um, I liked rewarding uh, a couple of the AHL guys with uh, NHL contract. So Owen Sillinger, Cole Sillinger's older brother, and uh, Cole Clayton uh, earned... Um, he earned his ELC, a one-year ELC, and then Owen Sillinger earned a just a two a a one-year two-way contract. Um, so you know, rewarded those guys. I like the signing of Zach Sorchenko. So yeah, I'm gonna give them a solid B plus for uh for this off season. Um, you know, the obviously final grades aren't in yet. There's still moves to be made, still things to be done. But as of right now, I'm pretty happy with Don Waddell's choices thus far. The off season. Excited to see what the next choices are, who the head coach is going to be, what these new contracts are going to look like, and uh, what the team looks like in October. And uh, that's kind of all I've got for today. Um, No episode tomorrow, unfortunately. I am traveling, but I will be back on Thursday, uh, hopefully with a breakdown of whoever the new head coach is, uh, which, again, reminder, I'm going to be on a plane all day Wednesday, so fully expect the new coach to be uh, announced somewhere between noon eastern and midnight eastern um potentially well but i would say potentially later but it won't be announced later than probably about 10 p.m eastern but uh, imagine expect it to be announced some point tomorrow because that's when they love to they love to announce things when i am actively on a plane that's when they hired mike babcock that's when so many things happened so thank you for listening to this episode though uh like i said no episode tomorrow back thursday I've been Jake Foster. You can find me on Twitter at underscore Jacob Foster, J-A-K-O-B-F-O-R-S-T-E-R. You can find the show at L-O underscore Blue Jackets. Uh, you can email us if you have questions, comments, criticisms at lockdownbluejackets at gmail.com. Uh, thank you once again for making us your first listen of the day every single day, even when I put an episode out at 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I appreciate everyone who listens, and you can find us... Uh, Wherever you get podcasts, you can find us on YouTube, you can find us on Sirius XM. And until Thursday, make sure you stay locked on.